on this Sunday night, soldiers refusing to relent. The city still is not fallen. Defying Putin's surrender or die demand, despite his claims of control over Mariupol. The Belarusians backing Ukraine. The people do not support him. At all. As their leader continues to support Russia, we hear from those fighting against the condemned country. The cost of China's COVID control. I think China realizes that if it loses control, it will have hell to pay. Residents in a large-scale lockdown clash with police over forced transfers to a quarantine site. <laughs> and migrants caught in a political feud. The Texas governor sends busloads of asylum seekers to D.C. in a protest against Biden's border policies. Global National, reporting tonight, Nitu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Russia's defense ministry says Canadians are among some 2,500 fighters left encircled in the besieged city of Mariupol after defying a surrender or die demand earlier this morning. The number of Canadians is not known, with some experts saying the number of fighters still left is closer to 800. Still, it appears the shattered port city is on the brink of falling, which would mark the Kremlin's first victory in nearly two months of war. Redmond Shannon has our top story tonight and a warning some of the images are hard to watch this is the huge azov style steelworks in mariupol according to russia's ministry of defense it is the last part of the city yet to fall with troops holed up inside its maze of buildings and tunnels Russia's Ministry of Defense says some Canadians and other foreigners are among the fighters inside the factory. Ukraine's Foreign Legion told Global News for security reasons it can't confirm the presence of Canadians at the site. The Kremlin had given the soldiers there a deadline of Sunday morning to surrender. That has been ignored despite a Russian threat to kill anyone who hasn't handed themselves over. The city still is not fallen. There is still our uh, military forces, our soldiers, so they will fight till the end. Ukraine's prime minister defiant when speaking on U.S. television Sunday. For, for them, life of the people is nothing. Vladimir Zelensky says peace talks will end if the remaining Mariupol fighters are killed by Russia. The Ukrainian president told CNN why he thinks the fight for the eastern Donbass region is so important. It doesn't mean if they are able to capture Donbass, they won't come further towards Kyiv. That is why, for us, this battle is very important for many reasons. Despite Russia's shift to the east and south, shelling continues in the north too. The regional governor of Kharkiv says five people were killed and at least 13 injured Sunday, with bombing reported near the capital Kyiv too. A moment of togetherness and community in the traumatized town of Bucha, a service to mark Christian Orthodox Palm Sunday, worshippers praying for the dead killed in alleged war crimes. This woman says her son Sasha was killed fighting Russian troops. I don't know how to survive such a loss, she says. Vladimir Zelensky says up to 3,000 Ukrainian troops have already been killed and suggests the civilian total is likely far higher than the official UN figure of almost 2,000 people. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Russia has increasingly become isolated internationally, but Belarus, which borders both Russia and Ukraine, has remained steadfast in its support. But that position has sparked an anti-war movement among its people. Acts of resistance have sprung up within the former Soviet state. And as Jeff Semple reports, a growing number of Belarusians are crossing the border to fight. In his first known trip outside of Moscow since invading Ukraine, Vladimir Putin met with his closest ally, the president of Belarus. Alexander Lukashenko blamed Russia's massacre of civilians in Bucha on British special forces and reiterated Belarus's support for Putin's so-called special operation. Since the start of the war, Belarus has allowed Russia to launch attacks from its territory. But the position of the Belarusian president and the Belarusian people appear starkly different. The people do not support him at all. This Belarusian software engineer is now in Ukraine fighting with the Ukrainian military. 
part of an entire battalion of Belarusian volunteers. One of their goals, to restore the reputation of their people. It was a big shame for, personally for me, that uh, Russian tanks invade Ukraine from the territory of my country. For their actions, he and others would face long prison sentences if they ever returned home to Belarus. That is, as long as Lukashenko remains in power. Lukashenko's position now is very fragile. On the one hand, he doesn't have support of most of uh, Belarusian people. This Belarusian opposition leader lives in exile. Her husband was arrested while trying to run for president in 2020. So she took his place and lost, sparking mass protests and allegations of voter fraud. Lukashenko clung to power with the backing of Putin, but his support for Russia's botched invasion of Ukraine may have sealed his fate. He thought that he is uh, on the side of uh, strong Russia. His future is uh, under huge question. Some experts believe Lukashenko's tenuous position is why he's resisted Russian pressure to become directly involved. By engaging in the ground war directly, Belarus can set and train dynamics that could in fact lead to popular unrest, which could indeed lead to the overthrow of the Belarusian regime itself. And with Russia's military focused on Ukraine, an uprising in Belarus would be more difficult to quash, spurring speculation. If Putin loses in Ukraine, his ally Lukashenko, Europe's last Soviet-era dictator, could be next. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Pope Francis made an anguished plea for peace in Ukraine today at his first outdoor Easter Mass since the beginning of the pandemic. Sia pace per la martoriata Ucraina. The pontiff called for an end to what he called the cruel and senseless war in Ukraine, delivering the message to an estimated crowd of 100,000 people. In his address, the Pope also mentioned Canada's journey to reconciliation, calling for wounds to heal as Indigenous peoples continue to seek truth. This comes just weeks after he met with First Nations, Inuit and Métis delegates in Vatican City. At least 17 Palestinians have been injured in a second round of violent clashes with Israeli police at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem. Israeli police entered the mosque, one of Islam's holiest sites, clearing protesters barricaded inside. Tensions are high as Muslims and Jews celebrate Ramadan and Passover at the same time. Palestinians have long feared Israel plans to take over the mosque compound or partition it. One of the world's largest cities has been shut down for weeks under China's zero-COVID policy. Shanghai's lockdown is pushing the bustling financial hub to a breaking point, restricting its residents from basic necessities and causing more delays in the global supply chain. As Mike Drolet reports, the rules are revealing rifts over China's strict COVID mandates. This is the Shanghai China wants the world to see. Empty streets and orderly COVID testing lines. Millions of people united with the goal of completely eradicating COVID. Videos like this paint a different picture of residents being forcefully removed from their homes to be taken to overcrowded quarantine centers that look nothing like the spacious, highly sanitized buildings presented to the media. And when it was announced the buildings in this area would be converted to quarantine centers, residents took to the streets in a rare public protest that was live streamed to the world. It is not unscathed in terms of moral, moral, um, you know, vagueness, but uh, I think it is doing the best it could given its population density of a 26 million person city. The unspoken element, this epidemiologist says, is that China knows it has to tackle COVID differently than much of the world, including countries like Canada, because the inactivated vaccines China chose to produce are far less effective than mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna. That, combined with low overall vaccination rates, could contribute to the rapid spread of the highly transmissible BA2 variant. I think China realizes that if it loses control, it will have um, hell to pay uh, domestically if, if it lets the virus spread. So they're making like a calculated decision and uh, obviously costing them economically, but you know, in certain ways they have the economic muscle to tolerate and the political willpower to tolerate it. China is still trying to achieve COVID zero, but it's also now beginning to take a more targeted approach. 
While residents who test positive for the virus are still being sent to quarantine facilities, officials are slowly allowing some areas of Shanghai to open up. While giving the green light for priority businesses to get the region's economic engine moving again. Mike Trollet, Global News, Toronto. The number of migrants crossing over from Mexico into the U.S. has hit a new high. The governor of Texas is facing backlash for his extreme measures to control the influx. Now the state says it is getting rid of migrants by busing them all the way to Washington, D.C. Jennifer Johnson reports. Four busloads of migrants arriving in Washington, D.C. Bueno, 2,700 kilometers from where they spent weeks detained at the Texas border. Families now stuck in a political feud as the Republican governor of Texas takes aim at the White House over greater numbers of immigrants crossing into his state. Joe Biden is not securing the border. The state of Texas is having to step up. The migrants are arriving in the nation's capital without support, tired and in some cases confused. Local charities are trying to help. Some had been traveling literally for months. Some were fleeing violence. Um, really desperate situations. The White House says Texas is grandstanding to bring national attention to Greg Abbott's conservative views. It's nice the state of Texas is helping them get to their final destination as they await in their, their outcome of their immigration proceedings. The White House was already feuding with Abbott over a controversial order the governor just repealed, requiring enhanced screenings of truckers coming into the U.S. from Mexico. Abbott ordered Texas state police to search the trucks for smuggled migrants and narcotics. Y si este... The mayor of Chihuahua, Mexico, says the delays have caused millions of losses in perishable goods. Texas has backed off for now on the truck inspections, but Abbott says his government will still expel as many migrants as possible. We will increase our border security in light of the President Biden's decision uh, to re eliminate Title 42 expulsions. Title 42, passed under President Donald Trump, a political ally of Abbott's, allowed the U.S. to bar over 100,000 migrants from crossing the border to stop the spread of COVID-19. The order ends next month. The CDC scientists determined for, on Title 42 uh, that it was an appropriate time from a public health point of view to lift the Title 42 uh, restriction. With that gone, Abbott and other Republicans warn another massive surge of migrants will soon be coming. And Abbott is promising they'll continue to be sent to the nation's capital for the Biden administration to deal with. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Coming up, why Canada's cannabis suppliers are still struggling four years after legalization. Legal cannabis is big business in Canada, contributing tens of billions of dollars to the GDP since being legalized in 2018. But while the industry is a major economic driver, growers are still facing challenges going head to head against the illicit market. Amadagahi takes us behind the scenes at one of the world's largest greenhouses. This is what a giant room filled with almost a million dollars looks like. Most of the value is in this room. Right. This room has about $800,000 worth of cost. It is as sophisticated of an operation as you can imagine. Pure Sun Farms, using 1.6 million square feet of its property in Delta to produce mountains of legal cannabis. Inside a factory of sorts, professional growers treating the plants like delicacies. The space smells exactly like what you think it would. It's also well ventilated. Today we are the number one producer of dried flower cannabis in Canada and as a single site operator we're one of the largest operators in Canada if not the world. Statistics have been harder to come across since the beginning of the pandemic but the legal production and sale of cannabis contributed 2.4 billion dollars to BC's GDP in 2019. That year 19 percent of people in BC reported to be using cannabis and 6.5 percent of Canadians polled by StatsCan said their consumption had increased at the start of COVID-19. More than three years since legalization, taxes and strict rules slowing down production have not made for a completely smooth road, but the province and the industry both agree the biggest challenge continues to be the black market. Facilities like this are highly efficient and from a cost basis we can outcompete the illicit market. So I think that's the first and foremost. Just as important is the quality of our product. In terms of transparency and clean product, there's been studies done that show illicit product is full of pesticides and 
illegal contaminants and we don't have access to any of those products to use. So customers know they're getting a clean, true, quality product when they buy legal sources of cannabis. What's next for this industry could be lobbying the province for on-site sales and regulated public consumption facilities sometime in the near future. Imad Agahi, Global News. I believe the time has come to reevaluate the Charter of Rights. Coming up, the calls for constitutional change on a milestone anniversary for Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It has been 40 years since Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms was enshrined in the Constitution. The Queen and former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau signed the proclamation on this day in 1982. But Indigenous people and racialized communities were given little consideration back then, and all these years later, some Canadians say the Charter still falls short. Eric Sorensen reports. 1982, a defining moment in Canadian history, repatriating the Constitution from Britain and enshrining the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and with it, legal protections for all Canadians. The Canadian Charter of Rights, which for the first time give all of us an identity rooted in the Constitution that no government can destroy. In those 40 years, Canadians have used the Charter to challenge legislation, and the Supreme Court has ruled on everything from abortion rights to religious freedoms to hate speech. Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, a lawyer, worked on protections for women in the Charter. This is an essential part of our country, of this constitutional democracy. But McFedrin and other human rights advocates in a virtual presentation said the Charter remains a work in progress. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a strong promise, but it's an unfulfilled promise. Indigenous Canadians and racialized communities were given little consideration 40 years ago. There were groups of Canadians today who, were, who did not have a voice when this were put together. I believe the time has come to reevaluate the Charter of Rights. Today, Charter rights are still being debated. <laughs> The rights of the Freedom Convoy to assemble in Ottawa became an angry confrontation, ended by the government's emergency measures, a recognition that rights under the Charter can be limited. And the rights of many Quebecers to wear religious symbols have been blocked by the province's secularism law. That's expected to be challenged before the Supreme Court. The existence of the Charter is no guarantee that the rights of Canadians are protected. So that to keep these rights, we need to stand up in defense of them any time they are threatened. But in spite of some disenchantment with the Charter, Canada's constitution is among the most admired in the world, says this constitutional expert. Yeah, the constitution of Canada has influenced the design of the South African Bill of Rights, the Israeli Basic Laws, the New Zealand Bill of Rights. Canada has become a model for the promise and possibilities of constitutionalism in the democratic world. Senator McFedrin pointed to the invasion of Ukraine and the war crimes that are occurring there to remind Canadians how precious our rights are and how important it is to protect and fight for those rights. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Next, a sign of the times, the story behind Vancouver's nuclear weapons-free zone. North Korea claims it has successfully test-fired a new tactical guided weapon. Still images published by the Korean Central News Agency show the launch of one or more rockets. No date or location is given, but the images appear to show leader Kim Jong-un observing the test. Experts believe it is a sign North Korea could soon resume its nuclear testing. The nuclear threat from the Cold War era has been over for decades, but one sign of the time still stands on Canada's west coast. As Squire Barnes reports, it's the last remnant of the peace movement that swept the city of Vancouver nearly 40 years ago. At the corner of Broadway and Boundary Road in Vancouver is this curious sign. It's been there for almost 40 years. There used to be more of these around Vancouver. It's very much a sign of the time it came from, the early 1980s, when Vancouver was at the forefront of the peace movement. And Libby Davies was very much a part of it. You know, we always understood that it was, it was somewhat of a symbolic gesture, but it was a really important demonstration of, the, um, of what people were feeling at the time. What they were feeling was fear, of being caught in the crossfire of a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. 
And of course, it's cities that were the target of nuclear weapons. And it was cities around the world that were leading um, a globalized peace movement. Vancouver's peace movement was led by a group called End the Arms Race, which would stage massive marches for peace. It became so uh, popular and mainstream. We would have cops wearing, you know, badges saying peace. We would have the mayor, we would have, you know, city councillors. Like, everybody wanted to be there. In 1989, Libby and some other protesters put the words on the sign into action by swimming out to the USS Independence, which had docked in Vancouver. Vancouver is a nuclear weapons-free zone. You have nuclear bombs on board. We ask you to leave our harbor right now. And every time I came up for a breath, I could see the sailors above me uh, hurling insults. Um, and, you know, it was to make a point that, that um, we didn't mind the, the USS Independence being in the port, but we just didn't want the nuclear weapons. Concern over nuclear weapons faded after the fall of the Soviet Union, and most of these signs eventually came down by the city's hand. They were never, they were never vandalized. They were never, I never remember anything where people were like, you know, oh, that's stupid or that's silly. It was sort of taken seriously, like this is who we are. This is what we want our city to be. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight, your Canada is the view from Mount Seymour in North Vancouver, B.C. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.